Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. It is our season in review edition. And there's a gentleman that you haven't heard from in about, well, I guess you heard from him on Monday. But you need to hear from him again because he has not gotten a chance to say his piece since he stuck to his guns in one way, turned his back on a promise he made in another way, but at the end of the day, Ari Wasserman was correct, and I was wrong. Ari, Georgia, your national champion, as you predicted in the preseason, as you flipped on your pledge to never bet against Nick Saban and bet against Nick Saban, you were right. Georgia beat Alabama. Ari, the floor is yours. I'm supposed to take off my shirt and run around the room now? <laughs> I, uh, we're doing this on video so yes absolutely yes we, um, we need some vod content i was actually listening to uh the podcast that you did with dave ubbin after the game and i was just like it kind of hit me i'm just disappointed that you didn't um stick with it man because you had the perfect the perfect 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 because i actually got the whole scenario yeah. right yeah it's like easy to if say you if you read what i wrote one. yeah if you read what I wrote, I, I did mention JT Daniels would play a big part in that. So I don't think I got it exactly right. But no, I I don't regret saying that I'll never bet against Nick Saban again. I feel like that is a pretty sound way to think. But it was wrong here. And for the reasons that that you and I discussed quite a bit. In fact, you know, I, I wrote a couple things in the lead up to the game saying, here's how Georgia can win. And here's what they didn't do the first time, what they what they could do the second time. And they they did that stuff. They did a bunch of different stuff. And, you know, the, the pressure on Bryce Young was obvious. Jameson Williams getting hurt certainly didn't help. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that that necessarily beat Alabama. I don't think that was that was the game, you know, game over when he got hurt. Alabama s still could have won the game. In fact, was in great position to win the game in the fourth quarter. But here's the way that I view it, though, Andy. I thought Alabama kicked Georgia's butt for three and a half quarters. Like, I know that everybody, like, and, and Georgia's defense had great red zone D, and uh, that's what won them the game ultimately. But it felt like Alabama was in control of the game until after the fumble. And, you know, even though Georgia ended up winning the game, I don't think it's this start to finish uh, Georgia triumph that everybody's making it out to be. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter what happened the entire game. All that matters is at the end. And I'm not taking anything away from Georgia, but like, if you bet Georgia minus three, you were not comfortable in that game until the pick six. Right. So like you're, you're in right. a moment where, you know, Alabama in what was probably a down year for Alabama standards was a half a quarter away from winning the national championship. So, you know, the, the thing that was, I, I kind of feel like a villain here from like a, a Marvel movie because <laughs> Everybody wanted new blood to win it. Um, everybody would have liked to see Michigan or Cincinnati do the unthinkable and make the playoff entertaining and have a different result. I came into the national championship game golden. Like whoever, it was the number one versus number two team in the composite rankings. I wasn't going to get inundated with a bunch of the well, number 41 new, team new in the blood country. did win it. I mean, I know, that's what Michigan I was say. won was a the... national title more recently than Georgia had. And that's what I'm saying. Like a, a, of the best case scenarios for somebody in my of my viewpoint, which is talent is the thing that trumps everything, but also somebody who is like the, the average fan who would like to see different results. So we're not talking about the same four teams every year on this, on this podcast, Georgia has been viewed as a, as a team that's at the cool kids table, like we've talked about, but they actually mm -hmm. won it for the first time in over 40 years. So even though they're winning recruiting crowns and playing in, in big games and sec championship games, it still was a different result. So I think it's really, really cool. Like, I don't know if I want to sit back and, and be like, I told you so. Georgia was going to win it from start to finish. All I did was pick the most talented team in college football and a team that I thought was going to be in a position schedule-wise to get there because their their path was the yellow brick road to the national championship game. You know, I don't feel like I'm some sort of genius. And at the end of the day, too, I also wasn't feeling confident about Georgia going into the game. Like, I thought Alabama was going to win before. I just didn't want to flop because we made it so far. I was four quarters away from being right, so why not stick with it? Um, that said... Watching that game from start to finish, it was a a complete showcase of what ultra talented teams playing at a high level looks like. And you know, both teams couldn't block each other. You had talent oozing in the secondaries. 
you know, the quarterback position on one side was super talented. The other one stepped up when it mattered the most and won. I mean, I thought, you know, and there were some key players missing. You know, I thought that was a, a good showcase for the two best teams in the sport and the best team in the sport that we were talking about all year and the unit that we were talking about all year prevailed. And I find that to be kind of satisfying because, you know, I don't know if you're with me on this, Andy, and I love watching uh, March Madness as much as everybody else. I think my bachelor party is going to be in Vegas for March Madness this year. But the thing about the, the yeah, yeah, sure. The, the college basketball championship is not satisfying to me because I sometimes don't believe that the best team wins it because it's so crazy. Like to me, right, I right. it's a single elimination tournament. It's yeah. basketball. So one great one player shooter, can, can, yeah, can win a whole game. Yeah. And like in college football, when the best team in the country from start to finish wins it all, I find that to be satisfying, especially in a sport where we spent 50 years, not 100% knowing who to crown. So like, to me, I thought this is a wonderful year. Um, talent prevails like it always does. It will continue next year and, and into the foreseeable future as long as the, the recruiting rankings look the way that they do. Um, but I don't think that I'm some sort of genius. I just think I'm somebody who only you know was able to pull up the 247 composite talent rankings and use his head based on schedules and paths. <laughs> I think you're a genius, Ari. I, I'm going to go with that. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to throw that genius label I mean, on you. I, but, everybody wants no, to vote, I mean, but it's like I don't even feel like it's – like was it that profound of a take? Like go back and look at, at no, the at the preseason. It it wasn't, but there there was a segment of people, and I, I the, the, they're very short sighted people, who just could not believe either because Georgia hadn't won since 1980, which again makes that no didn't sense. matter. Yeah, they're very talented. Who cares when the last time they won was? And they believe Kirby Smart could not overcome Nick Saban. And you and I have have repeatedly said on this show over the last couple of years. If you build that kind of talent base, you will keep getting bites of the apple and eventually you will win. You will break through. And that's what happened. And would it surprise me at all if this is the first of several or the first of many for Kirby Smarts Georgia? No, it would not. No, it seems like that's what it is. I mean, I don't know. Bill Landis and I, and, and maybe we'll get some other people involved in this, um, are working on this story right now very early. Um, in early stages but after the national championship we always like to look at like preseason way too early rankings for the following year but you know what doesn't oh, yeah. exist and maybe we can make this into the audio form too a Let's program rankings list like where would you rank the programs from start to finish because that that doesn't always fluctuate based on who wins the most recent national championship so like if i were to rank Let's the programs right now I would still rank let's Alabama do it now. number one. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. I and like, I would, and if we were to do it like in a story form, we'd probably take math into consideration, like giving a certain amount of points, um, a certain amount of points for national championship, a certain amount of points for playoff berth, a certain amount of points for ten win seasons, recruiting classes, and all those things. But off mm -hmm. the top of the cuff, the the results will be different because of how we view it. But like, I think Alabama is unquestionably the number one program in America still. And then number two would be Georgia because they won the most recent national championship and they've been they've been recruiting at a high level to sustain that success. And then when you start getting into three is when it gets difficult. Well, with Georgia, we have not seen them completely reload a year after they they had a great year like to that. Well, 2018 probably should have beaten Alabama for the for the SEC title. I'm not sure they would have been able to beat Clemson if they'd played them. Uh, 2019, you know, that, that was a down year for them. Uh, and then 2020, they didn't even win the East. So like we need to see them reload and be able to stay on that level. That's how they get, that's how you get to compete with Alabama for number one. There is no question that Alabama is number one because we know Alabama will be in the mix next year for the national title. Will they win it? We don't know. Will they win the sec? We don't know that. I think we could. Basically, they'll be in the we know they'll both. be in the playoff. Yeah, right. Um, and like, I want to, I, I want to do it for as a forward thinking thing, because you can go back mm -hmm. and say, and this is why number three gets tricky, because I think there's only two answers for number three, and that would be Clemson or Ohio State, right? And if you if you pick right. one of those two teams, how much do you weight Clemson's championships? Because they've won two titles uh, more recently than Ohio State has, and Ohio State only has one since fourteen. 
But if you're looking at which team is more situated to compete at a high level moving forward, you might pick Ohio State. So this is where things get a little bit dicey. Yeah, if, if it's forward looking, I'm going to go with Ohio State because they've recruited at that level. They've actually, and according to the rankings, recruited at a higher level than Clemson. They have a quarterback right now that you would feel very confident could lead a team to a national title. Like I, I feel very confident in thinking that CJ Stroud could be a national championship leading quarterback. So I don't feel as confident about DJ Uyunglele. Now it might be that Cade Klubnik comes in and you feel completely different. And, and that changes how you feel. Starting week three. But as we yeah. sit. Yeah. As we sit here, I would put Ohio state at three. Okay. So if we put Ohio state at three, then Clemson automatically slides into four. Yes. Now, Who's next? That's because the thing that gets tricky. This is, this is where Oklahoma would have been, probably. But we don't know because they're in flux. Caleb, I, I was assuming when Caleb Williams announced that he was going to transfer, that buying or that he was going to enter, enter the transfer portal, I should be very careful as I say that. He didn't announce he was going to transfer. He still a, conceivably could go back to Oklahoma. And if you looked at Dylan Gabriel's announcement about betting on himself, he did say he was going to Oklahoma with no guarantee that Caleb Williams was was gone. So I don't know where Caleb Williams lands. I'm assuming it's not Oklahoma, but I don't know where it's going to be. So Dylan, let's with Oklahoma. I guess we evaluate them with Dylan Gabriel being their quarterback and Jeff Levy running the offense. We've seen those two work together before with with success, but you know I I don't know where they're at depth chart wise after losing some pretty good players and you know Brent Venables is, is just but you also have to take into account who the head coach of these programs are it's Absolutely. like I think we like you know, might I don't know Brent Venables as a head coach yet and this is what this is what makes it really really difficult because you can take data points and results from previous seasons the last five years and you could say Oklahoma clearly um, outdoes USC in all those metrics 10 win seasons playoff berths conference championships all of it but at the same time, it's like if you want to pick what program you would you would go with moving forward, I might be more prone to pick USC as a, a as a team that's more likely to win a national championship in the next five years than Oklahoma would. Let me let me let me throw two at you. And I, I have a feeling you'd put both of these in your in your six through ten, but but two as a potential nominee for number five. Brian Kelly's old school and Brian Kelly's new school. Yeah, I mean they're all they're all in that mix. You know, I think I would put LSU ahead of, of Notre Dame just based on the, the talent that's available to LSU, the area of the country. See, I would, situated. I would put Notre Dame ahead of LSU right now because Notre Dame has been more consistent. Brian Kelly's got to prove that he can make LSU consistent before I, I, I feel confident making them even higher, but you're right. He will inherit a ton of talent because that's where the lack of uniformity comes into play though here. Right. Yeah. I mean, I just Notre Dame's an interesting one because if Notre Dame had a, an established elite quarterback coming back, I'd feel very comfortable sitting, sliding them in there at number five. Like, I, I think Marcus Freeman's going to do fine there. I think he's going to recruit very well. He may even recruit better than his predecessor. He certainly, so far, seems like he can do that. And then, you know, I, it's just that I'm not sure where they stand at that position. LSU, they're also not established at that position, and they've been wildly inconsistent. So that's why I would I would still have Notre Dame above LSU there. Yeah, but I understand that LSU here, has, I think you has have a lot like, of talent. Think about it a tad deeper than that, though. It's not which teams are most situated to be really, really good in 2022. It's which programs have a foundation and are – sustainable for long-term success and that doesn't i'm not saying that notre dame and, and lsu was in a good debate notre dame's foundation is better than than lsu's right now then i think you could make that argument and put them in at number five regardless of who the quarterback is in either of the programs yeah well that's what that's what i'm saying yeah. i i don't know who no, i like i i would put notre dame at number five right now and then lsu or oklahoma somewhere you know somewhere in that six to ten range who else? Who else falls into the, into the six to ten range? Well, is that what's where, interesting. I'm wondering is where do you put Michigan now? That's what I was going to ask you. Where do we put Michigan? Where do we put Penn State? 
Where do we put Wisconsin? Where do we put – well, Florida just fired their coach. You know, if this were that, if this were last year and Florida was coming off those three seasons, we'd put them much higher. I that That's the part I'm, I'm trying to figure out. It gets really murky really fast once you get past the, those – those five or six. Yeah. And it's like, when you start talking about Penn state, oh, Michigan, A&M, and, you know, A&M is the biggest one. Like I think I would put A&M in the top five. Like I'd probably put A&M ahead of LSU and Notre Dame because of what I they just did in the room. ahead of Notre Dame right now, just because they haven't really gotten over the hump. But once they get over the hump, you, you would have put them in the top five every year. But what do you, what do you think is the more important hump recruiting like Alabama or making the playoff two years ago? Making the playoff. You think that making it in the past is more valuable than what can happen next? Having made it matter. And the thing is, Notre Dame has had to go undefeated to make it. They've made it in a league. Like, I'm sorry that I, I, I'm going to put them ahead until A&M proves it can do it. But if somebody now, put a gun to your head right now and said, which team are you buying stock in for the next five years? Which one are you taking? That's the point of this. Oh. One one has a new bright be young coach that is expected to do big things. But here's another thing that I'm going to, I'm going to veer this off of when it comes to like, we could be on this. You, I, we joked before this podcast started, everyone that we have to be out in two hours. And Andy said he'd be divorced if he's in all. I, I could, I'm going to drag you into the pits of hell for three hours. If you really want to go down the road. Okay. But, now, now we got to figure out where Michigan state's going to be. If you're going to drag me into the deep end. Yeah. But right. here's the thing that into the that deep water, it's very interesting to me. And this isn't just a where do the programs stand conversation, but of all the programs in college football, because we didn't even mention Oregon, and this is an Oregon discussion too. Oh, and which it definitely teams, Oregon needs to be in this discussion. Which teams in college football are most reliant on a national recruiting strategy? The two are the two powers that come to mind, obviously, are Notre Dame and Oregon. Uh, because all the other teams that recruit nationally also have a solid foundation. Ohio State has a foundation. Ohio, LSU, Louisiana, Texas, and Texas A&M have Texas. Florida goes without saying. I don't need to go down the list. Georgia has Georgia, Georgia. has the best <laughs> possible scenario at home. But but no matter what Oregon and Notre Dame do, Andy, they have to they have to be successful nationally. And if you look across, from they coast they, to coast, they have to work harder. You're right. They, they, right, they right. absolutely have to work harder than everybody else. And if you look across the country, and and this is this pertains to the discussion of where would you put these pl- these programs on the list of program rankings. There isn't a pocket of the country with a ton of talent that has a ton of outward weakness at the head coaching position from the nearby powerhouse. Like Lincoln Riley at USC makes recruiting Southern California harder. Sark and Jimbo Fisher in Texas make recruiting Texas harder. Not that it wasn't already hard, but the Houston area, the way that A&M is having it under control, that's harder. You go well, and, and, and Venables at Oklahoma too, because yeah, let, let's be honest, Oklahoma is always going to get a lot of its best players from right. Texas. Has historically always done that, and so you and have so, to look at Brent Venables being there as someone who is going to take some of the best of Texas every year. Yeah, and if and if you take if you take Texas off the board, and I don't think that Notre Dame was particularly huge in Texas, but they're down in Texas. Um, then you go into Florida. You've got Billy Napier, who's already shown more recruiting chops than Dan Mullen did in two months. And you have Mario Cristobal, who was unquestionably one of the best recruiters in the country in South Florida. You go into Georgia, where when Mark Richt was the head coach at Georgia, it was a little bit easier to get guys out of that state. It's a lot harder now. And everybody and their brother is in Atlanta. There aren't a lot of pockets where densely populated uh, uh, densely populated talent areas with with liabilities at head coaches at the programs that should be recruiting them the best. So for a recruiting standpoint, I look at Notre Dame and I say, well, they've been a very, very consistent team. Brian Kelly, you could make an argument, squeezed every bit of potential he could have out of there. But if I'm looking at Notre Dame's recruiting strategy right now, which is a lot of California and a lot of national a national reliance, I'm thinking to myself, well, where do I go? Like that's it's gonna be a, like in a world where Marcus Freeman and this is actually probably a really good story for Pete Sampson if he'd want to do it. But in a world where Marcus Freeman is going to be expected to increase the output of their recruiting results, he's also coming in at a time where it's probably the, it's at its hardest of the last five, 10 years from a good recruiting coach standpoint from a national perspective. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. I do. And it is. But I do think they've got a pretty good foundation 
so that when they come in, they can say, look, we, we went undefeated in the regular season, and made the playoff in 2018. We, we were in a league in 2020 and we made the playoff. We made the championship game. And so I do think they can come in and, and, and fight those schools. They have a pretty good education to sell. I know that doesn't always the, matter, but the automatic in at Catholic private schools too. Yeah. They, they get it. They get guys into the NFL too. Like Harry, he stands back coaching the offensive line there. How many great offensive linemen, first round offensive linemen, did Harry Heastan recruit and help develop? Like, that's that's the thing you got to think about. So, but it's just going to be harder. I so if you have a program that's in the top five in your program rankings, you have to take into account: can they continue to recruit at a level that is necessary to? to get the results that would indicate a top five program. And it's like right now, if I had to choose between A&M and Notre Dame, uh, I would pick the coach that's won a national championship already and just sign the best class of all time at a place that has all the money in the world during the NIL era and a passionate fan base and plays in a, and you know, they haven't done it yet. And I understand that, but part you, ba- of my- you basically, you basically described Georgia during the, the earlier Kirby smart period. And I would have picked Georgia in the top five, four years ago. Or three, I would have, yeah, I would have too. The second, the second too. that Georgia signed a top top class and beat Alabama for that distinction, you knew Kirby was going to get it eventually. You can go find so, bylines of mine from four years ago that say they're going to win eventually. And that's what's interesting too. So what you're saying, and I'm I'm inclined to agree with you here, is that if Jimbo Fisher keeps doing this, it will be just like Kirby Smart, where. They will just keep chipping and chipping, and, and eventually yeah. it will break through. If they sign four classes in a row that are like this one, they will be built like Georgia. And I'm not saying they're automatically going to win um, and beat Alabama and do all the things that they need to do in order to get there. But if you're built like Georgia, you have a chance. Now, obviously, AM has a uh, uh, disadvantage in the sense that they have to play Bama during the regular season every single year and win that side of the conference, which is a lot harder than – than what Georgia had but to do. They did in order beat them this there. year. And they did beat them this year. So, you know, I, and also, we don't know what Alabama is going to look like in four or five years. And, and that is probably going to be the sweet spot of when AM arrives because everybody at Texas right. AM right now is probably, you know, dancing in, in the streets of we're going to finally get this done. Look at this class. I think people need to realize it takes more than one class. I don't care how good your class is. If you want to be built like Bama, it takes four years. So if they can do this over a four-year period, which I have every reason to believe in my heart that they can, then by 2026, when we're talking about the the playoff, I guarantee I'll bet playoff, anything yeah. that they're going to be in that discussion. And I don't know that wow. I would bet anything that Notre Dame would be. And I think I might have successfully changed your mind. If we're talking about who has a chance to win the national title sooner, I I I, I think I agree with you on A and M. If we're talking about just a level of consistency, if you if you're looking for a program that's going to get you to the NFL, that is going to be very successful while you're there, Notre Dame's been more consistent so far. But no, I without question, I think. And you're when right. you start making when you, when you start making rankings of which programs are the best, but you have different criteria, like you're going past and future. Like, of course, some people's pasts are going to be better than some people's futures. And like when you start ranking them in the same list using both sides, it can become inconsistent. It was kind of like the playoff rankings this year. But like, well, I'm, I'm doing this as more of the past being somewhat predictive of the future. And that, that's the thing with A&M. And, and here's the thing about A&M that I, oh, we've done, we've both done our verbal crutches today. I don't know if you noticed we had a discussion about that on Twitter the other day. I say here, this, here's the thing too much. And you say in a world too much. Oh, that's wow. What, this. Yeah, I do say in a world too much. That's right. And I say here, here's the thing way too much. So here's the thing. <laughs> the talk about Texas A&M and whether Texas A&M can win a national title. Because Texas A&M has had all these resources, has had all these advantages, has had everything you should need to win a national title. And yet some for some reason could never do it. Is no different then saying Georgia can't win a national title because they haven't won one since 1980. Okay, if we're playing chess, I'm about to I'm about to move my queen into a check position here. It's the we're same agreeing here. No, I know, but we're, I'm also going to bring the something same else. Argument. But I'm also going to bring is... something else into this. Okay, Texas. If you th- if you think that what they couldn't do for the last oh, 40 no. years 
is an indication. I, I, listen, I'm on the same side of the U as Texas, but like if anybody has any question about what I'm going to view Texas A&M in the, in the context of what they just did in the recruiting realm, it's so freaking predictable. I punted on Texas. I'm out. I'm with you. I'm out. But of course I feel the same way about <laughs> A&M now. Back. But of course, <laughs> but of course I feel back. the same way about A&M now. A&M did the right. thing that Texas had already been doing. Now, if in six years A&M still stinks, then we'll have to have a discussion about what's going on in College Station that's preventing them from getting over the top the same way that we've beaten a dead horse over Texas with. But like Texas A&M, in my mind, is uh, uh, the king of of Texas recruiting right now in a very prestigious conference with a coach who's won a national championship and has more talent on their roster coming in than any other team in college football. It's like, of course I'm going to agree with that or, or believe in that. Okay. Well, that and, and that answers one of the common questions I get is who's the next first, like who's the next first, first time playoff participant. Who's the next first time national champion. And, and well, first time we can say first time since, because obviously A&M won in 1939. So they got that going for him, but I think I think first modern the, era national title. I guess I think picking the next newcomer to win the national title is a lot easier than picking who's the next playoff crasher. Well, A and M could be the next playoff cl- crasher. Yeah, yeah, but it's got to win. If you let's say they won the West next year, but I don't. Obviously, I don't think they will. I'm gonna I'm gonna go into the season thinking Alabama's gonna win the West, but. If they can win the West, they can make the playoff. Yeah, I mean the, the problem with A and M is that they will never have the the um, ability or the uh, the chance that Georgia had to lose to Alabama in the regular season and then get a chance to beat them again in the in the playoff. Because like most likely, and unless you think that the playoff, it's just a lot harder to get in as a non conference champion game participant, right? So well, it, it could it could happen. It would be the same thing as as Alabama getting in in 2017. When yeah, they lost to yeah. Auburn it's just a lot win. harder than like Georgia's path to the national championship game this year was the easiest possible path an SEC team will ever have. Like you miss yes. Alabama in the regular season. Um, you have LSU. They played LSU right when they were down. Like they they didn't mm-hmm. really have that marquee matchup until they played Alabama in the national championship. Or I mean, in the SEC championship game, they got well, they, they didn't play there. LSU at all. They they played Auburn and oh yeah, they Auburn. missed LSU. Out of the West. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that, like their their entire schedule was facing middle tier SEC teams that are are still very good. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's never going to be easier than what they what they got. It's much easier than somebody coming out trying to come out of the West. Yeah, and it's- they also got their butts kicked in the most important game of the year for them leading into the playoff. And we're still granted access to the playoff, which if you're doing that in the same division, which a and found out two years ago during a shortened season, when you lose by 28 points to a, an in-division rival, the chances of making the playoff from that aspect is much harder than getting in, in Georgia's situation. Cause like, honestly speaking yeah. any other year, like, honestly, what if Ohio state was undefeated this year? Like there's a realm of possibility where if they were if this was a regular year and Clemson and Ohio State were both really good that Georgia wouldn't even oh, make the playoff yeah. at all. Or Georgia would have had another loss if Clemson were undefeated just because. Of oh, that's right. That's right. Play this year. You you get but, what I'm saying. If there was another. Oh yeah, absolutely. Another undefeated Power Five champs or one lost Power Five champs. Like if Ohio State would have beaten Michigan and won the Big Ten championship, that would have taken a spot away from Cincinnati. And if Clemson would have run the table, that would have been a very interesting situation because they lost in the opener. I'm, I'm just saying in, in a world where Scott, I got to stop saying in a world, in a world. It's in my head. In it's a like world. in a world. It's like a trailer in a world. But as we look back at all the other playoff fields, most of the time there's four bona fide, legit power five champions ready to take the field. And this year for Cincinnati to get in, that just means that there was nobody else to put in over Georgia, but Georgia's lucky enough that this happened in a year where they were still able to get in. Yeah, it, and it's a right reminder of how many and, good teams in the past didn't make the playoff who were probably good enough to win the national championship. Well, and that's I mean, you, you've had that with Georgia, like the 2007 Georgia team might have been the best team in the country at the end of the season, but they had two earlier losses and they were out. So they went up playing Hawaii in the Sugar Bowl. And you, you've you know, I, I would have loved to have seen 2012 Texas A&M in the playoff. I think that would have been a heck of a lot of fun watching Johnny football <laughs> as they got into like chipper shredder mode. So I would, I would have enjoyed that. Remember two so. years ago during the pandemic, Andy, 
when everybody in College Station wanted me uh, out of media and wanted to burn my house down because I said that you can't get into the playoff if you lose the one game you can't lose uh, by 28 points to your rival. Um, now I'm like Texas A&M's biggest fan, and I think they like me again uh, because of what they did in the recruiting realm. But now Georgia won a national championship in a year, uh, a year later after I said that losing to your rival or in the game that you can't lose by 28 is a prereq to, to getting out. Georgia was in a situation where they were still able to get in. So I think they're, they're, they're very lucky to have been given the path to play Alabama again. And what obviously resulted in the most cathartic possible win in the history of Georgia football. I, I am a hundred percent in agreement with you. I think this is, is just been, this was a different year. And I don't know if it was because there were teams that had a lot more experience than they would have had because of the extra year because of COVID or because they, they felt like they didn't really get to show themselves in 2020. So they came back and didn't go to the NFL, but this felt like a very different season. Now at the end, there were still kind of two elite teams and Alabama and Georgia looked like they were playing a different sport than everyone else. But as you go down the rest of the way, it felt like a much more equitable season. If that makes sense. And, and I'm wondering, Ari, do you think that continues as long as those people who got the extra year are still working their way through the system. Do you think that that is um, the reason why it was what it was? Like, is that the, is that the, the explanation for why there was more parity this year than any other year was because most of these teams had 22 year olds playing on their offensive line when they wouldn't have otherwise. Yes, I, I do. I, I, I do because you know, like Oklahoma state, I feel like is a prime example of this. Their defense was fantastic. Their defense was old. Their defense was super old. And I think that's the reason they won the Big 12, the reason they they were so good all season. And the thing is, though, I think they can probably stay old. I, I think I don't I don't know that they particularly can stay as old because they had some guys that were, you know, fifth and sixth type, you know, la the last one. This is super senior. You got to go after this. But are there going to be guys who would have been a fourth year senior playing? this year who would have been leaving who will be back next year who will continue to keep those teams old it's it's the college basketball thing get old stay old if you're a mid-major yeah and you know the thing about the nfl though is that it's calling and if you're good enough to to go then you go regardless of what you know your circumstances but at the same time too there are a lot of very old players in relation to what they have um uh, in college that aren't NFL players, but also a very good football players at the college level that are just older. So like, it would be a very interesting case study to go back and look like, if you want to come out and say, well, which team is going to be the one that crashes the playoff next year out of nowhere. It's like, well, the, the path to finding that is probably which team has the most fifth or sixth year seniors on their roster next year. Yeah. Who has the most 22 and 23 year olds. And <laughs> you know, who knew BYU had it, had it right all along. Like yeah. <laughs> they, they had it figured out. But what let's let's talk about this season. What were some of your favorite teams this season? Like who'd you just love watching? Wake Forest. Oh yeah. They were a lot of Sam Hartman. Uh they were old. They were really old on defense. Like Jeff Masterson should have been gone. Like I, I remember talking to those guys. He was in Florida like, planning his wedding, wasn't sure if he was gonna come back or not. And and they're like, dude, please come back. We, we could have a special team and uh, uh, Fox, the, the D lineman, he was in his sixth season. He came back. Cause he was just like, I love these guys and, and I want to be, be around them another year. And I mean, that was a, that was a very special year for them. They win the division. And I got to say that the, the, their game against army, <laughs> the, the, the least the defense I've like ever seen played in a football game. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, they were definitely the team that I enjoyed watching the most just because of everything that you were seeing. Like it was obviously offense and scoring and scoring and scoring, which we all love, 
Um, though I will say that I thought that the first half of the national championship game was tremendous. And if you hated it or you were acting like it wasn't entertaining or that neither team was very good, then I don't feel like you know uh, much about the way the sport looks when both teams are very good. Like, I thought that was super awesome. Um, that said, nothing is, is better than offense and, and scoring, and that's what we all like. And they had the story. They had the heartwarming story behind it. They had a window into potentially winning the ACC because Clemson was down this year. And, you know, it was just a very fun ride. And it's unfortunate that our sport is set up in a way where a team like Wake Forest, the way they were this past season, could never win a national championship. But it also doesn't mean it wasn't very fun. And I'm, like, looking back and, and trying to, like, remember, there were a lot of really, really good individual games this year. Well, and, and I think I think Pitt was one of the more fun teams. And for the yeah. reason that we always make fun of them for on this show, like, their games are nuts. Like that North Carolina game in the rain and overtime was yeah. crazy. The fake slide is one of the best moments of the season. <laughs> yes. Uh, Kenny Pickett's swag. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, the fake I get why you keep going back into the trap. For, for, yeah. for reasons we understand that, you know, if, if you actually are going to slide and like if Kenny Pickett were faking that slide and somebody had hit him, they would have run out of flags to throw. So we get why they made it illegal, but it was still cool when it happened. The two coolest plays to me were the fake slide and then Caleb Williams stealing the ball back from the back against Kansas to keep going, which I think also might have not been legal, depending on how I can't. Yeah. There was a, something that people were complaining about after that play. But the fact that he even thought of it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, I am kind of surprised that Kenny Pickett was the first person to ever attempt that. Like when you think about how long the slide has been in and how afraid right. everybody is to hit a quarterback, it honestly though it 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 was super athletic. Like it's not very hard to do it. The I would way have that he did broken. It. I would have thrown my back out. My, what a slip everything! I've thrown my back out, <laughs> torn every ligament and tendon in both my legs. Like it would have been horrendous. Yeah, like he was on the way back. His feet were forward, and then he just took off. It was incredible. It hurt to watch. Yeah, it really did. But um, you're right. I do wonder why it took so long. I was a. I remember I was a teenager when when Dan Marino did the fake spike against the Jets to win the game. Yeah. And I remember thinking when that happened, like, how come nobody ever does this? <laughs> it's true. Um, so games. You want to talk about games? Yeah. Because I think the best game of the season. This is going to be a debate. The best game of the season to me was the Oklahoma Texas game. It was the Red River. Yes. Oh. I mean, because Texas... It broke my heart. Xavier Worthy <laughs> takes the first play from scrimmage to the house. Texas dominates for a half. The true freshman quarterback gets put in for Oklahoma. Looks like... And remember, he had not played football in a year and a half when, when that happened. And he looked like he'd been doing it forever. Was that the game of the year? It was amazing. Because you had it's the drama. Close. It wasn't just the way the game played out. You also had the drama of Spencer Rattler eating. Bench. If Texas if Texas had been good the rest of the season, it would be better. The problem is Texas being bad the rest of the And maybe that game crushed Texas. I don't know. But them being bad the rest of the season takes a little shine off of it. The, uh, the, the, the thing that I, I consider when we're talking about best games is what were we all feeling? What was our entertainment level in the moment? And I think everybody who loves college football who was watching that game was level 10 entertained during that entire game. Um, but another one, too, was the AM Alabama game. You got to give AM some props. Oh, there. yeah. Tremendous Absolutely, game. Absolutely. Because AM AM controlled most of that game. Alabama storms back. And you are sure once Alabama takes the lead that there is no way AM is going to win that game. But sure enough. I got another one. You want to hear the other ones? I'm ready. Oklahoma State, Notre Dame in the bowl game. That was awesome. That was a great Fiesta Bowl. Best Fiesta Bowl we've seen in some, quite some time. And I don't think there will ever be a better Fiesta Bowl than, than the Statue of Liberty one. Uh, but that was, I thought, that was a very entertaining game. You, you know what, what game entertained me in, in a kind of sicko way? Which one? Illinois over Penn State in nine overtimes. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, that's a moment. It was that, amazing. Yeah, the two point conversion rule, um, the shootout rule in in uh, college football is I I really like it. 
I don't know about you. I think it sucks. Like, especially if it were to determine a game where the playoff was on the line. I don't, I, I don't like it, but I, I, I do understand it. It provides drama. Like there, there was some Maximus echoing in my head after watching that game. Are you not entertained? I was highly entertained and I was more entertained by the fact that Illinois could not throw the ball at all. <laughs> and they bring in Peters right at the end and then throw it. Just you know, another one, sad. another one, yeah. Michigan state, Michigan, tremendous football game. Oh, that, that actually, now that I think about it, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to take back what I said about Texas, Oklahoma, Michigan state, Michigan. And you and I watched most of that together. We did a live stream yep. for that game. That was the best game of the year because now I, we all know how I feel that I think Michigan got jobbed on that, that call that they should have gotten a touchdown on the Ajabo strip sack because it looked like he was laying on top of Ajabo when he was being sacked. But the fact that Michigan appeared to take control so many times and then Michigan State just kept coming, like that was an awesome game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the fact of the matter was is you got to go back in, in time and put yourself in the position that you were in, and that was Michigan – needing a, a huge top 10 win for the first time and Harbaugh not getting it done. And you were just like, Oh my God, it's happening again. And then the way that the season played out, it makes you go back and, and respect what Michigan state did that day and what Kenneth Walker did and what a transfer can do. Mm -hmm. And like, that might've been the game that got, that got Mel Tucker, $95 million. It, it very well might, by the way, Mel Tucker, the guest on Monday's show. So you can, you can hear all about it. Can you ask him about his $95 million? Have... I didn't ask him for a loan. No, I, I should I ask? Should I have asked him for a couple bucks? I just want to be like, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do, man? Like I would honestly. We did talk a little bit about about something you can spend money, a lot of money on that that he had an idea uh, that he threatened his players with that that he could he could actually probably afford to do now. But we'll, we'll, I, you can I, hear about that on Monday. I would love to sit down in a room with Mel Tucker, just one-on-one, -on -one, no recording devices, nothing, and just go, why are you even, like, what are you, get, like, just go through the next four or five years. It'll be better if you got fired because it's all guaranteed. And then just go live like Jordan Belfort. Like, you're, you're good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're good. You're turning Mel Tucker into the Wolf of Wall Street? <laughs> good Lord. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know about you. Let me ask you this, and I know we've played these games before, Andy, but if somebody hands you $100 million. Sure. Oh, no, no, I, this is my favorite part of the podcast. Go ahead. Somebody gave you $100 mil, How would you live mm -hmm. the rest of your life? I'd do podcasts with you. Uh, from a yacht? <laughs> but probably, yes. From, from, my, from my chalet in, in Colorado or from my, my – Beach house on the Redneck Riviera on 30A in, in the Panhandle. Uh, it'd be I'd be in a different place every time. I'd have a penthouse in New York. By the way, I think I've spent most of it. <laughs> I don't know the way the real yeah. estate market is in most. Yeah, of I, know. I think I've just I spent most of it. So sorry in New about York that. Sixty million. So you're already out. And honestly, so we're I, gonna have to we're gonna have to keep doing podcasts because I gotta keep getting paid. I don't know if a hundred million dollars is enough money actually to live the life that I would live because inflation it's like seven percent. Did you see that? Uh, I, saw I, that. I saw you would if I had that much money, I would have a yacht in the Mediterranean. Britt and I You're would no longer be a billionaire together. for that. Yeah. Okay. So let's just change the question then from 100 million. Like if you had an unlimited amount of money, because I don't want somebody to be like, okay. well, actually, the docking fees for a yacht are actually $100,000 an hour. It's like, okay, dude, like that's not what we're getting at. So I'm going to say 100 billion. It doesn't matter. Money is no object. Like I love my fiance with all of my heart and I hope that she would stay with me, but I would be on a yacht somewhere in the entire, in the Mediterranean. I'd be throwing lobsters at people. There'd be a hundred <laughs> women on the boat at all times. Uh, hopefully Brit with me. There'd also be men on the boat to party with. And I would just be running the clock out in the most amazing way out in the ocean. I would watch college football. <laughs> I am just imagining you. Have tarp, you seen Goldfinger tarp off? A hundred percent of the time, never wearing a shirt ever again. You would never have a shirt. That's what I was, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> you, you would never, never, ever be in a shirt. The chest hair would be going. Oh my there'd God. Be a lot of there'd gold, be a whole chest hair situation. Gold chains. Probably a gold medallion resting in the chest. Right hair. in between the, the, the chest. Yep. Right. Right between You'd the boobs. You'd probably become a speedo guy because who's Who going to criticize you at that yeah. point? 
Yeah, there's no such thing as an you, ugly, you throw them off the yacht with that much money. Yeah, okay, come on my yacht and make fun of me for anything. You're off the yacht. You want to play that game? There's no such thing as an ugly rich person. Okay, <laughs> I'm just imagining you throwing lobsters at people. You know, like fun coupons, throwing money in the air, fun coupons, and eating like I, whatever I want, never worrying about my weight ever again. And I don't care if I die too soon. Ari, at, at a certain point, you would become. Job of the hut. Like you would have to be carried places on a litter. But every single thing that I would eat would be amazing. Like if I want a filet o fish, I'm gonna have a personal chef to make me the best filet o fish ever. Or if I want lobster, I'm gonna eat it for breakfast. Like there'd be no like every single meal I had would be chef chef prepared. Jeeves, get me the filet o lobster. Like every like it's like sometimes like I hear like Bill Gates drives a Ford Explorer and I just like want to strangle him. It's like you already won at life. Like I would be the most obnoxious, the most, I would buy the dumbest stuff. I, I honestly, I would be, I would just be like, you know what? We're going to run the clock out the right way. So th- this reminds me, there was a conversation going back. I believe is this was, this happened probably about 20 years ago. And I, I will not name names because I don't want the, you know, this person might hear it. I don't want to, you know, we'll protect the innocent here. But there were a bunch of us talking and, and we're all in our very early 20s. None of us has any money. And we're saying, if you if you could get any vehicle you wanted, any vehicle at all, what would you drive? And so, you know, I'm, I'm talking about like the, the most souped up Escalade ever, you know, custom this, custom that. Uh, somebody else is thrown out it's probably you know, during the, the, the nicest, my ride days, right? Yeah. The nicest Porsche or a Lamborghini or Ferrari. And this other guy goes, should have a trailblazer. And we're like, no, 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 you can have anything, anything you want. And he's like, Chevy trailblazer. And I'm like, but do you, you understand the point that. of the exercise here? Yeah. But it makes sense. Like it, it does. There are certain people that that's, that's what they need. Can I throw my they best friend under the bus? I'm not going to say his name, but one of my best friends in the entire world is a medical malpractice attorney. And this dude makes almost a million dollars a year. Like, I mean, he is okay. loaded, loaded. Like, this is my closest friend. I went to middle school with him. Oh, boy. So I see. So, and this man lives in a one bedroom apartment and drives a 2011 Infinity. And the only thing he cares about is buying stocks. So he doesn't buy material things. He just, all he's obsessed with is accumulating wealth and accumulating wealth and accumulating wealth and never using it for anything. And I always joke with him. I said, well, I hope that you have a cool public library. You're going to donate it to when you're gone, because I think it's insane to me. And like, but it's just a reminder that every single person gets joy from other things so like i would enjoy That's right it's driving it's a rolls you happy yeah i would drive a rolls royce phantom everywhere i went and i would never wear a shirt and i would have a big gold chain so he wants to buy more enough, shares my, my of son went my son went through a a a luxury sports car kick or it's like supercar kick and we one day took him to the the exotic car dealership in orlando just so he could look at some of these cars up close. Cause we, we just happened to be driving by and we figured we'll stop in for a few minutes. And, and, you know, we, we weren't going to spend too much time there. We don't want to be the, those looky loos, but the guy there was so, so nice to us. He actually like let my kids sit in a, in a, a Lamborghini. And, um, but it was really interesting. I was, I was asking tons of questions because I, I'm never going to be in the market for, for any of these vehicles. Don't say but never. We were looking at, <laughs> we were looking at the Rolls Royces and the, and the Bentleys and stuff. And the guy goes, the guy goes, yeah, I, the Rolls Royces are great, but they're not for you to drive. They're for someone to drive. Well, two you. door ones in the convertible are. No, he said, he, he said, basically the Bentley is the better driving experience. Like Bentleys are made for the owner to drive and Rolls Royces are made for yeah. someone to drive you in. Well, I did valet once in college. And um, I didn't know how to drive stick yet. And Uh-oh. somebody brought in a Porsche 911. This car was like 200 grand. And it was my first day on the job. And I stalled it in front of everybody. And that was my first day. 
And that was my first day doing valet at the JW Marriott Tucson Star Pass. And like everybody was like, oh, and the guy was like, I've stayed there once. Yeah, yeah. That, that was like one of my college jobs running valet there. And uh, ever since was that the never, nicest, what was the nicest vehicle you ever got to park? I drove a, um, a Bentley convertible. I don't know which exactly it was. And then at that point, my manager never let me drive a stick again. So like some of the Lamborghinis and stuff that came in, I wasn't able to drive. Um, the, was it was it the Bentley with the suicide doors or was it? Um, this was 2010. So or 2009. Okay, so it was different. So it was a different yeah. different era. But um, I drove I drove a few Bentleys. I drove one Rolls Royce. And then there were a bunch of, of cool sports cars like Porsches and stuff. But if it was a, I, I really put myself in a bad position because I was never trusted to drive a stick again. So, uh, and some I, of I don't like, but it's, it's interesting though. Cause I don't know if this is my age showing or, or what, but when I got the truck I drive now, I was like, Nope, I'm good. But your truck I, like, is it, like it became, very expensive, Andy. It's what's well, nice. Yes. I, I'm not going to lie, but there are, there are things that are much, much more expensive, but I wouldn't want them. Like I want that. It, it, as soon as I started driving, and I was like, "I'm good." If this is the only vehicle I drive again for the rest of my life, like if I own this thing for 20 years, I'm good. Yeah, we're in a weird position, and it's funny that we're talking about this, and we're going on 15 minutes of non-football talk, and I love That's this okay. podcast so much. I need to get a new car, and mm-hmm. Britt has it in her mind that I have to have an SUV because she's getting an SUV, and I want an SUV. Um, or I want a car, but she thinks I need an SUV. So I'm probably going to get an SUV. You're going to like an SUV better with, with young children. And I will say we had a, we had a Honda Odyssey for five years when our kids were very young. Do not knock the minivan. It's a freaking movie theater on wheels. I can't, and when you I can't have drive a minivan. Kids, it's the best. Yes, you can. I, I you can refuse. Ari. I can't. You can drive the minivan and then on the other side of it, get the i don't know the maserati or the maybe you'll be maybe you'll be getting a bentley by that point maybe this podcast will have taken off so much that that i'll still have my truck because it's all i want and you can get a bentley you know what i really want andy i want what do you really want ford i want the new bronco but i want i want it to have the four doors and the rag top but the ones that are nice are a hundred grand so if I'm going to spend a hundred thousand dollars, I'm not buying oh, a thank Ford. You. So you know that's that's kind of the thing. But it's like the actual. Um, if you want an SUV, you have two options. You've got eighty grand and up. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Jeep Grand Cherokee in the middle, which are about fifty new, and then everything else is like a Ford Edge for, for twenty three. I've no, never priced the um, is the Grand Wagoneer super expensive because those look really cool. Yeah, it's like a suburban hundred grand. Oh yeah, they started oh, like ninety three. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, All right. a great wow. Jeep Grand Cherokee, sixty grand now. The two door one, Lord. Two. Yeah, and I don't know if it's well, just then, the, then the let event. me just tell everybody buy a Raptor. <laughs> In that yeah. case, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want, I want a Raptor. Um, I think my fiance is gonna splurge because she just had a um a midlife crisis, I think. But we're gonna try and go test drive some of those Mercedes GLEs with the digital dashboards that uh nice that self park and then that's going to like ruin my budget for the car that i'm going to get so like she's going to get a nice car and i'm probably just going to end up let with me, a chevy let me, trailblazer let me, chevy trailblazer let me tell you something else as long as she's driving what she wants your life's going to be better so you, that's right. you just let that let that go let that happen i did want to get back to our, our favorite games discussion because okay. we were talking michigan and michigan state and i, I want to know where this game because it in terms of competitiveness, this game wasn't very competitive. But where does it rank in terms of favorite games to watch or best games this season? Michigan, Ohio State. It's in the mm-hmm. snow. Michigan wins. Super cathartic moment. Harbaugh breaks through. Like, I feel like that, If unless you were an Ohio State fan, which, of course, then it, yeah. it was awful for you. But for everybody else, in terms of just general viewership, like, sure, it was a pretty cool moment to see. Absolutely. Yeah. And and of course, when you watch uh, football games, you want to look at the games that, you know, reveal something new or that show you something new. You know, the problem with that game is that it wasn't overly entertaining because Michigan just kicked the crap out of Ohio State up front and ran the ball down their throat. And that's not always the funnest viewing experience, but it certainly was it was certainly 
um, something new and something exciting. So for sure, I think that belongs on the list. I've got another one for you. Okay. And this one will never be remembered. In five years, nobody will ever talk about it again. Season opening weekend, Florida State versus Notre Dame overtime game. Oh, it was awesome. You know, people will remember it because Brian Kelly tr- butchered the John Robinson joke in the post-game interview. But, yes, Mackenzie Milton comes in, throws some touchdowns. Yep. Like, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, and it was like and, and also it, at the time, if you put yourself in that in that moment, you're thinking to yourself, Notre Dame is awesome and so is Florida State. Florida State's back. You almost well, and, felt- and crowds are back. Like that yeah. was the first time, like prime first time weekend game. we got to see full stadiums. And and the and Doak Campbell's going crazy. So yeah, don't tell Florida State what happened in the next couple of weeks. But at that moment, it was it was incredible. I I, I think you're right. And I, that was the one where for me because it was Labor Day night. It was the game everybody was watching. I basically remember thinking this season's going to be awesome. Yep, because the fans are back. We're going to have ex- real genuine excitement. Let's go. And and I got to say. I don't think the season disappointed. Did two superpowers from the SEC play for the national title? Yeah. But we got we got a lot of new dishes. Played a fun game. Yeah. We got a lot of new things. I mean, we got a new Big Ten champ, yes. two first-time mm-hmm. trips to the playoff, a group of five discussion yep. that actually culminated in them making it. Um, o- Oklahoma's stranglehold on the Big 12. Ended. Yep. Um, you know, there was a lot to see this year. And I, I think that, um, by and large, the season was probably one of the more memorable ones of the last five years. If I had to, if I had to like really think about that, because oh, you had some yeah, new and you had some a, old, and it culminated with the best team in the country winning it, based on the unit that we could talk we talked about all year. Yeah, the defense. I think you're right. I, it was it was a lot of fun. It was the year defense struck back, and I don't I don't think that was a a fluky thing either. I think I think defenses have finally got gotten a little bit caught up that they got caught so by surprise by the clock rules changing in 2008 and, and the up-tempo offense is it basically everything changed so fast that the defenses couldn't really adjust schematically. I think now they've had enough time. And so you will see actual decent defense being played. It is possible to have a dominant defense again. So I think that's good for the game. I, I don't, I don't, I, I like the cycles where, the offense it's like the is, is up. Clemson the defense game is up. really good this year, don't you think? Uh, it was. I don't I, know. I, I was I, entertained, but it was pretty ugly. If you have, if you have, uh, two top ten teams or two five, two top five teams in the third or fourth quarter, separated by a touchdown or less, it's entertaining to me. All I care about is two good teams playing and not knowing who's going to win, and every play mattering, and that's entertainment. It doesn't have to be fifty-five to forty-eight for me to enjoy it. Well, there there were a lot of different ways to enjoy college football this year because you could you could enjoy Georgia Clemson, you could also enjoy Wake Forest Army, and, and and everything in between. So it was a wonderful season. Ari and I made some ridiculously stupid bets. I bet on Pitt a couple times. That that tells you all you need to know. But I had a blast. We're gonna keep going with this thing. Ari and I are gonna keep talking. The digressions probably will get more frequent. As, uh, as the offseason goes on. So just be ready for that. Uh, and just imagine Ari shirtless in weighing twice as much as he does now because he can afford <laughs> every single piece of gourmet food on his yacht, being carried from one, into his y- uh, one end of his yacht to another, just throwing lobsters at everyone. And then when the boat docks, me getting off the boat and into my decked out Honda Odyssey. <laughs> Well, you'll be able to fit thanks to the sliding door. Yep. We'll talk to you later.